On the surface, life felt calm in the early 50s. After all, it was the height of the American dream. But war was producing heavy casualties in Korea, and peace talks were stalled. The Vietnamese were pushing the French into a corner in Indochina. Revolt was also brewing in Africa, and on a tiny Pacific atoll, the U.S. detonated the first hydrogen bomb. In November, with the Cold War raging and McCarthy-era hysteria at its height, Dwight Eisenhower was elected president. It wasn't an easy time to be different, to think outside the box. But in Chicago, a group of people, teachers, labor organizers, clergy, and other visionaries, could see beyond colonialism and perpetual crisis. They saw a way to challenge the superpower politics of their time. They could also envision, at least in outline, solutions based on cooperation and direct democracy. Inevitably, they said, the world was moving toward freedom. One of their leading voices was William B. Lloyd. Toward Freedom, the name of the publication he founded, was based on the title of a book by Nehru. Nehru was already inspiring what became known as the non-aligned movement. He also inspired Bill, who had met him during a visit to India. After a conversation, Bill he f said he found Nehru's grasp of world history and his leadership on behalf of the dispossessed enormously impressive. The first issue of TF, as the newsletter became known, appeared on December 6, 1952. It included reports on Britain's response to the Mau Mau Rebellion in Kenya, one about a defiance campaign against apartheid in South Africa, and news on an attempt by Asian and African nations to get the UN more engaged in mediation between France and its African territories. But the story doesn't start there. Years earlier, at the beginning of World War I, Bill sailed to Europe with his sisters and mother on the Ford Peace Ship, Henry Ford's attempt to end the war. He was seven years old. It was a powerful experience and helped make him a fighter for peace, racial justice, cooperation, and self-determination. The roots go back further to the late 19th century, and his grandfather, Henry Demarest Lloyd, HDL as he was known, was also the father of investigative reporting. A muckraker before Teddy Roosevelt coined the term, Lloyd attacked oligopoly in articles, speeches, and books. His ideas were radical, yet he was popular in liberal churches and the emerging middle class. As financial editor of the Chicago Tribune, Lloyd documented the corruption and violence of Standard Oil and called for regulation of the railroads. He also led the clemency campaign for the Haymarket anarchists after the tragic events of May 1886. This alienated his father-in-law, William Bross, part owner of the Tribune, and led to his resignation. But it didn't stop him from writing Wealth Against Commonwealth, the first well-documented expose of a monopoly, Standard Oil, a classic indictment of capitalism. It is also an argument for radical reform based on freedom, love, and community values. HDL opened the door for advocacy journalism, combining democratic values with outrage, solid reporting, and sharp perceptions. By the time HDL died in 1902, his home with Jesse Bross, Wayside, was a well-known meeting spot for labor leaders, reformers, and thinkers. Jane Addams, Hull House founder Ellen Starr, and Bill's mother, Lola, who co-founded the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Lola worked with activists like Florence Kelly, Alice Paul, and the Hungarian feminist pacifist Rosica Schwimmer. After the war, she and Rosica helped develop an idealistic plan for world government. Bill absorbed it all and wrote two books, Town Meeting for America, calling for a constitutional convention to change U.S. foreign policy, and Waging Peace, an exploration of the Swiss approach to conflict resolution. But his most enduring contribution was Toward Freedom, which he founded and edited for 34 years. TF covered the world from a fiercely independent perspective. Where did the U.S. really stand on Africa? What is self-government? These were the questions Lloyd and his writers asked. They knew what the big powers feared, sustained public attention on what was happening in so-called non-self-governing territories, so they held classes and lectures, traveled to hotspots, and brought back reports. One of TF's most respected early writers was Sid Lenz, who covered the Mau Mau conflict in 1954. When all the sensationalism eventually dies down, he wrote, what will emerge in clear focus is a burning desire by a native population for some kind of land settlement, the same burning desire which is activating hundreds of millions of colonials in Asia and other parts of Africa to seek independence. The stories TF covered were often ignored by the mainstream press, but it had a small, well-connected mailing list. One prominent reader was a young senator, John F. Kennedy, who praised TF's coverage of the Algerian Revolution. 
It was the only publication to report in advance on the historic 1955 conference that launched the non-aligned movement. The idea was real independence rather than neutrality or passivity from the East and the West. TF chronicled the movement's ups and downs for decades. In 1957, Bill traveled across Africa filing reports on independent struggles and interviewing leaders in Ghana, the Sudan, and Tunisia. TF also had groundbreaking coverage of the former Belgian Congo. Toward Freedom was a small voice, but its influence and advocacy for the elimination of colonialism were felt. Like independent publications since, it comforted the afflicted and afflicted the comfortable. As conditions changed, the focus shifted to the impacts of neocolonialism, the challenges of independence, and non-aligned nations as peacemakers. Bill also took up another cause, satellite broadcasting, as a tool for development and peace. In 1981, after the U.S. refused to condemn a South African attack on Angola, a New York conference on the liberation struggle in South Africa adopted a forceful declaration and a plan of action. Bill Lloyd asked me to cover the story, but nothing about it appeared in the New York Times. Little had changed in 30 years. At the final plenary, Lennox Hines called it the seed that will take root in every city, village, and state across the United States. As the anti-apartheid movement spread, he was proven right. In his 80s, Bill retired and moved to Vermont. In Burlington, the organization found a second home that has nurtured its work for the last three decades. The content and look evolved from a four-page newsletter on new nations to a magazine that covered the entire world and was sold on newsstands across the country. The Utney Reader called it one of the best alternative magazines covering international affairs. New board members like Dave Dellinger pressed for stories and insights that went beyond convenient options and the Washington Consensus. After 52 years, the last print edition appeared in 2005, but the work continues online at TowardFreedom.com, where stories from authors around the globe are published weekly. TF also publishes books and other media, organizes events, and participates in grassroots campaigns. Measured against the forces of cl corporate globalization, alternative enterprises like TF can feel small, but for 60 years this publication and many others have challenged the notion that there is no alternative with an equally powerful idea. Another world is possible. Anticipating the Arab Spring, democratic internationalists like Bill Lloyd understood that political independence, while essential, brings few benefits for the vast majority when one party states corporate rule and local elites replace imperial power. As Robin Lloyd once said in a tribute to her father, challenges lay ahead, but TF continues to embrace Bill Lloyd's advocacy for global human rights and inspiring vision of a peaceful, cooperative world.